Um, if you have your Bibles, uh, it's, it's not going to be on the screen. I did not give this to our technicians in the back, but, but we're going to go to Psalms chapter 105. We're going to start at verse 1. And like I said, we're going to go into our second week of gratitude is altitude. The more grateful you are, the higher you're going to go in life. The more grateful you are, the more spiritual blessings are going to come your way because you're going to understand how to receive that within gratitude. And like I said before, I simply titled this message, A Grateful Response. A Grateful Response. Psalms 105, starting at verse 1. This is the English standard. This is what it says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Tell of all His wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. And let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. Remember the wondrous works He has done, His miracles and the judgments He's uttered. O offspring of Abraham, His servant, children of Jacob, His chosen ones. Father, as we go into this second week of, of the series that You have placed on my heart, I pray, Lord God, that You would arrest us for just a moment. Father, I believe that you are already in the building, God. You have been welcomed here by our worship. Father, you inhabit our praises, God. And I just pray right now, Father, that you would just sit upon each one of us and you would speak into our hearts what we need to hear to get closer and to move in your way, God. Father, help us to understand what you want us to hear. Father, we understand that it might not be the whole message, but there's something, God, that you have for everybody because you've seen this day before it came. We love you and we thank you. Let me be a voice for you, God. Let me be a mouthpiece that you use. Only your words be spoken today. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. So last week, we, we started talking about what it was to have a grateful mind. We, we, we looked at a grateful mind and how it looks and remembers where they were when Jesus came for them. A grateful mind dwells on the words of the Savior, and a grateful mind always remembers the faithfulness of God. But a grateful mind is not where we stop in our journey with God. A grateful mind helps us to understand and to move from remembering to responding. Today we're going to look at a grateful response. Without action, there is no life. Without responding, there is no change. I've simply got two topics or, or two things that we're going to talk about today. First, and simply is this, responding alone. You know, when I begin to think, begin to look at history of, of some, some martyrs of the Christian faith, you know, a lot of times we look at martyrs as those in the Bible, but there's been many modern martyrs that, that we, can, we can draw inspiration from. And, and one, I found a quote by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, you might have, have known, heard the name, but Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a martyr um, that, that, that took place, if I'm not mistaken, in Germany. He was a disciple that, that came to Christ later on, but he started discipling, and, and it was, it, he reminds me a lot of Paul, because he spent the majority of his life in prison being, being tormented because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And he says this, it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. You know, I could probably close my books right now and I could be done. If you begin to let that, that quote, that statement rest heavy on your heart, it's only with gratitude that life becomes rich. Because once life becomes rich with gratitude, once we understand what it is to be grateful, we understand that it's not stuff that makes us grateful. It's not an abundance of things that makes us grateful. You see so many people that have everything that they want and they're miserable in life because they're not grateful. But you can see somebody that has holes in the roof, the holes in the floor. They have no idea what they're going to eat and come in two or three hours. And yet they're the most grateful people you will ever see walking around with so much joy because they understand what life's all about. But as we begin to look at a grateful response, we, I want to look at, at, at a particular scripture that that we all know, matter of fact, I even preached a sermon using this text before a couple months ago. But responding 
alone is what I want us to dwell on for just a moment. As we talked last week, gratitude is a powerful thing. Gratitude changes the atmosphere of where you are. It will bring everybody to a place of discovery when you, when you walk around with a grateful mindset and grateful actions. Gratitude will fuel your passion. So many times in life, we do not get what we want all the time, but when we become grateful for what we have, it will fuel us to continue going to where God has placed on our hearts. Gratitude will cause you to do things that you never thought that you would do. You see, when you look at the word gratitude, it simply means grateful or thankfulness. Other words that, that uh, talk about gratitude is acknowledgement. When you're grateful, you will acknowledge something. When you have gratitude, there's obligation that, that, that comes within your heart. There's honor that you want to, to give somebody or, or something. There's indebtedness that you feel because all of us never feel like we deserve anything, but, but we feel an indebtedness to something, someone, and we want to show them gratitude. There is no better story in Scripture that paints this picture than the one we find in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 is, is I like to title myself, The Scent of Gratitude. Luke chapter 7 is, is, a, is a scripture that we have over and over. Matter of fact, it's in all the Gospels, this particular scene. However, Luke is different than the other Gospels. It is not the same picture that we find in the other Gospels. And so many times we get them mixed up and we get them put together because there are three different occasions to where Jesus is at a banquet and he is anointed by a lady. Luke chapter 7 is not the same as the other. Luke chapter 7, there's not a name for this young woman that came into the banquet. The other ones you see that, that, that Jesus went into a banquet as a guest of Simon the leper. This particular story in Luke chapter 7, he's at the house of a Pharisee. So you already see, well, there's a reason and, and there's, there's probably some underlying things going on at this. that The Pharisee didn't just invite Jesus. They wanted to see what was going on. But, but here Jesus, as he goes, and it says, no matter how powerful gratitude can be, sometimes it's alone. Have you ever been walking in your life and you had to turn away from people because they're not following Jesus Christ? And they're not following Jesus, but yet you are. But yet their life is going better than yours according to their eyes, according to the things and the successes that they have. And because of that, they look at you and they say, well, why do you have to be, what, what do you have to be grateful for? I've got the promotion. I've got the bigger house. I've got the three kids. I've got the bigger car. I've got the timeshares and all the big islands. Well, what do you have? You, you can't even have your lights turned on. They're coming to turn them off tomorrow. What do you have to be grateful for? Because they're beginning to look at the natural, not the supernatural, not the spiritual. But we have to understand that sometimes gratitude is alone. Gratitude or an indebtedness is what this woman felt as she walked into this banquet. When she found out what Jesus was, she was not a guest. She was not invited. She was, she, uh, sometimes I, I begin to think that she kind of just skirted behind all the commotion that was going on in the banquet. You know, I, I, here Jesus is. He's already done some miracles, man. He, he, he's the talk of the town. He, he's the guy, right? He, he's the one everybody wants a piece of to see what's going on. And so now he's at the house of this Pharisee, and I believe everybody in town was coming. So I believe the lady could, could, could they come into this house without anybody really seeing her because she was hiding behind all the commotion. You see, sometimes... That Jesus is in the middle of people, but there's so much going on, they never realize who is really in their presence. They never realize who is sitting right in the midst of who they are. Yet the Savior, the one that could change everything that they have, is sitting there. But here she comes. This woman was known, but not for good reasons. Some people, theologians say that she was a prostitute. Some people say she was a streetwalker. She was a woman of the night. She was one that, that did not have good qualities. So, you know, it, you know, we don't need to associate with her. But, but I begin to think that I bet you it got a little uncomfortable in the room because some of those men that were in the room knew her. Some of those men in the room knew her personally 
And as they're, they're eating with their big and all this stuff going on and they got everything else going on, all of a sudden here comes their little skeleton walking in the room. They say, oh, Bubba, how did she come in here? She needs to leave, but they're going to find out really who I am. She, she's got to go or she might tell my stuff. You ever, you ever been like that? Y'all, you know, every, life's going great, and all of a sudden a skeleton walks into your room. <laughs> Ooh, woo. When did this skeleton get life again? <laughs> oh, Jesus, you need to help me right now. But here she is, and she comes in, and, and, and I, I get the sense that they had a feeling that she might tell some stories about them. And she's looking at him, and, and, and I, you know, she, she's not paying no attention to him. Now, now get, let's, let's get the picture right. When she walks in that room, there was one thing that she saw. There was one person she saw. There was, there was one agenda that she had to check off, and it had absolutely nothing to do with Bob sitting in the corner, had nothing to do with JoJo over here in the corner, had nothing to do with Paul back there. But all it had to do was, was this man that was reclining at the table with his feet behind him, and there was something about this man that she felt that she needed to go into the presence of all the vipers. Right, because Jesus called them a brood of vipers. Well, John the Baptist called them a brood of vipers. And here she has, right in the middle of a brood of vipers, a brood of vipers. and so she's going to do what she, she came there to do. And as she got to where she was going to, nobody was standing up and saying, this lady has been changed. She, she's got a different aura about her. She's got a different sin about her. There, there's something wrong. I know who she is. But as she begins to walk into the room, the indignation, I felt, I could just feel it just, just coming down hard. How many of us would feel the same way if we were sitting in the room and all of a sudden all of our skeletons started to come in? We would start looking, I told you to get away from me. I, 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 I told you to get away. What, what are you coming here for? What are you coming here for? And see, everybody was looking at her like she didn't belong. Whatever the reason, she made a decision that caused people to look down on her, people to walk on the other side of the street. People did not want to be associated with her. Her presence in the room brought about indignation. Those feelings and whispers and looks could have brought about her action, could, could, have, could have brought her down to the ground if she, she paid attention to what they was going to say because they was going to remind her of who she was. They was going to remind her of what they know about her. You, you got anybody in your life that way? That wants to remind you of what you were? That wants to remind you of what you used to do. There was a gratefulness in her heart that only grew the longer she stayed in the room. See, here's, here's the thing that you've got to understand. The longer you stay in the true presence of God, the more gratefulness you're going to begin to bubble up in your heart. The longer you stay where He is, and the longer you begin to feast where He is, the more gratitude is going to become who you are. The longer we stay where He is, the more out we're going to begin to do the things that He wants us to do. You see, as she was, as she was there and she was, she was getting closer to Jesus, she began to look out and she began to see judgment was peering out from every eye in the room. And, and as everybody was looking at her, she began to see that love stood still because as, as everybody was, was shooting her remarks and shooting her, her looks and, and giving her this, this, this head nod that we like to do all the time, who does she think she is? And everybody's doing all that. Jesus never moved. And every, every time everybody was beginning to, to do what they wanted to do and, and to, to enforce their will on this lady to make her leave, Jesus remained still. Because love will never run. Love will never get tired. And love will never give up. Because it says His love is forevermore. And He will always be there with His love. His faithfulness will never end. Uh, accusations begin to fly under the breaths of all these people as they begin to whisper. Don't you love it when you walk into the room and as soon as you walk into the room, you see two people do this? And they look at you again. They just kind of... And then there's another bigger group over here, and they get over there, and they begin to say, talking, no, not him, that one over there. Right? And as they begin to do that, you begin to look, say, oh, they're talking about me. They, 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 don't, they don't believe me. But they got to understand that what I want you to understand is a grateful response means you're not doing this for them. You're not doing this to get their approval. 
You're not doing life so they can come pat you on the back and give you the things that, that they think that you need. You're doing this because there was a God that sent his son and his son stretched out his arms to show you how much he loved you. And no matter what you did, no matter what you're going to do, no matter what you said, he did not come off the cross and slap you in the face. He kept his hands and his arms on that cross, his legs stuck together and let, took his last breath on this side of eternity because he loved you that much that he wanted you to understand what gratefulness was all about. She understood that accusations were flying around but forgiveness was sounding just a little bit louder because as Jesus did not move, he was telling her, I approve of you. I approve of what has happened in your life. I have spent time with you and I know what you have gone through and I know what you have done. There was a pounding in her chest that pushed her forward. You ever got to the place where God's beginning to talk to you and God's beginning to draw you and the, and the more you step towards the altar? Because you got to understand, well, well, preacher, why does everybody come to the altar? Because you have to, to submit yourself to come out in front of everybody else and say, you know what? I need help. Uh, I don't care what you think. You can't help me. You ain't done it yet. If you ain't done it yet, you ain't going to do it. But I know somebody that can help. I know somebody that can take me to the next place. So I don't care what you say. I don't care how you look. I don't care if you don't like my smell, my perfume, or whatever I got coming off of me. But I'm coming to the altar because I know that at the altar, I'm going to lay myself down in front of Christ, and he's going to make me whole if I lay it at the cross. You see, this lady did not care what people were saying about her. She did not, she did not care, but, but her, her chest started pounding within her. Her heart began to pound within her chest. And there was a sound like no other that was drawing her. It was a familiar feeling that was present. A familiar aroma of acceptance. A smile and the open arms that was waiting her as she got closer and closer to the table. The closer she got, he didn't move. <laughs> she got right up on him. He didn't twitch. The Bible didn't even say he looked behind him. The Bible said he didn't even look away from the table. But he was reclining at the table with his head to the table and his knees and his feet behind him as they did back in the day. And he didn't flinch. And as he was there, we all know that she broke her alabaster box. And as she broke her alabaster box, she began to, to cry heavily upon his feet because of what he has done in her, because of what he has done through her, and because she was a, a new person. The Bible says in Luke 7, 44, it says, Then he turned towards the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? This was after the anointing. This was after she'd done everything else that, that we sing about in the song, Alabaster Box. This is after Jesus was reclining. He was looking ahead. And as he was looking at them, I could just see Jesus looking at the Pharisee that, that invited him to the house. And as he felt the drips of, of, of tears hit his feet, he looked at the Pharisee. And as another tear dripped his feet, he looked at the other Pharisee and he began to look at the other people in the room. Now, this is my mind. This is my imagination of what happened in the room. And, and as he began to look in the room, he finally stopped. Verse 44 said, Then... He turned towards the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see what she has just done to me? Do you understand you did absolutely nothing? Some people are not going to understand the praise that you have for your father. Some people are not going to understand the things that you have been delivered from and, and are not going to go along with, with how you, you give praise back to your God. Some people are not going to, to, to accept the way that you express your thankfulness to a Savior that gave his life so you can have something else. People are not going to understand that. Some people are not going to understand your gratitude, but he will. Some are not going to know your story, but he does. He was there. He met you there. He freed you there. He loved you there. He called you there because he was there. No matter what you went through, no matter what you're going through, no matter what prayer has not been answered, no matter what defeats come your way, He was there, He always will be there, and He's there with the keys to freedom. All you got to do is reach up and grab those keys, and He's going to give them to you freely because He's already paid the price. Is there any gratitude 
in your heart because of what he's already done for you. I understand you're still struggling. Maybe that's life. <laughs> life is struggles. You, you could be the richest person in the world. You're still going to have some struggles. But this lady was not worried about how they were feeling. When your last breath was about to leave your body, he reached out for you. And he says, your time's not up yet. I could just imagine what this woman was going through. And on some of the things that other women have, are going through, even in today's society, I could imagine what she's going through. As a woman back then, she was pretty much property. You know, she, she had to stay in the back. And, and she didn't have a voice. And she didn't have this. And she didn't have that. And here she comes. She's one of those that had been beat up with all kind of stuff, made decisions that were not good decisions. And now she's in the presence of the Pharisees. I could just imagine the fear she had as she walked in that room. And as she began to walk in that room, that fear was overcome by gratitude. When she began to take a step through that threshold, fear stayed behind her at the door. And I can just sit here and say, you need to stay back here. I don't need you no more. Watch what's about to happen. And she got closer to her Lord. She got closer to her Savior, closer to the one that has freed her. You see, when your faith is about to die for the last time, He will bring life back into it. Your gratitude is not dependent on others' understanding. I'm going to say that again so you understand it and hear it again. Your gratitude is not dependent on others' understanding. Your gratitude is dependent on Him. Plain and simple. Your gratitude is dependent upon him. Her gratitude and expression, her unwillingness to stop, changed the atmosphere in the whole room. Because she was unwilling. She had a grateful response. She had to give back to her Savior. That changed everything. And it was like, well, this, I don't even want to be here no more. Y'all don't let anybody come in here. I thought this was an exclusive uh, celebration for us and we was going to do this. But now you didn't let this person come in. Now anybody's a welcome. Yeah, because the Bible tells us that Jesus says, go to the highways and the byways. Invite everybody in because those that, that I have made this for, they decided they didn't want to come. They had too much going on. So I want you to invite anybody and everybody that will come in and hear my message and be a part of my banquet. I want them to come in. And all of a sudden, the door's open. Here she comes. She says, I'm coming. I'm coming. You spoke to me. You changed me. You set me free. You did something in my life that nobody else did. You touched me in a way that no man has ever touched me because they always did something dirty and always did something that's painful and always did something that was hateful. But all you did was spoke, and your words touched my heart and changed me from the inside out. Everything is possible with God. There was a grateful response that came from her. You see, people gain strength because of a woman that was in a place that she was told not to be and told that she was not good enough, didn't stop her, but gave God everything, and most importantly, her heart. The Bible tells us in Luke 7, verse 50, and Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Shut your mouth. He didn't say healed you. Shut your mouth. He didn't say made you clean. He didn't say give you a new place in society. He says your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you an eternal home where I'm going to be. It has, it has changed you because you walked in here when nobody else wanted you and you did not let anybody stop you. A grateful response is dependent on what you're going to do for your father that's already given you everything that you could ever imagine in life. Not for what you can't have today. You see my boys, you know, my handsome little boy over here in the front row. He gets mad at me sometimes, don't you, Jay? He gets mad at me sometimes because, you know, he likes video games. I don't know video games. I don't do video games. I'm bad at them, you know. And, and we, we pick on him because well, him and Gavin, you know, I, I say pick. Sometimes it's jail. You know, you, you spell it however you want to spell it, but that's what it is. And, and we, we got a time limit where they can play certain games. And, and sometimes I understand they play well beyond their time limit. I'm walking there to the boys. How long have y'all been playing? I know you're over your time limit. Don't you think you need to turn that off? 
And they will get so mad. And so then we begin to say, man, you're, you're just ungrateful. You don't understand. He's got a game system. You got a game system. They got a game system. You got a TV. You got a TV. You got it. Blah, 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 blah. You're ungrateful. Think about the people that have absolutely nothing. But yet you have everything. But what, what, what I'm saying is, is so many times we begin to look at what we can't have right now. We don't step back and realize what God has already given us, what God has already done in our life. You see, there's, a, there's another quote that I found by a young man named Charles Spurgeon. You might have heard the name, maybe, maybe not. But it says this, it says, It is not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. It's not how much we have, but how much we enjoy. Our gratefulness is not depending on what we have. Our gratefulness is depending on what we, what, how much we enjoy what God has given us. So what? He's given you a stick and a rock. Baby, you can make all kinds of games with that. There's so many kids that don't have a stick and a rock. Right? There's so many things we can do in life, so many things we can do in our spiritual life if we just realize what God has placed in us. And when we realize what He has placed in us, nobody else has the giftings that we have because we are completely unique within Him. But see, sometimes we don't respond alone. Our gratefulness is not a grateful response alone. But sometimes our grateful response is for those that are alone. Sometimes the touch of God on our lives moves beyond your walls and should move beyond your walls to those around you. Your grateful response should not be contained within yourself and walking around like you're a, a jumping bean and doing whatever and just have so much energy. That, that, that should not be what gratefulness looks like. God's touch is not top secret. You do not have to be read in to understand what the touch of God's all about. Don't you love those, those shows when you're watching it? And they say, well, I need to know what's going on here. He said, you don't have the clearance. You haven't been read in yet. So many times we, we take the anointing of God and the move of God and the touch of God and, and we, we put it under lock and key and we put that red stamp on it that said top secret. But God is not top secret. God's touch on your life is meant to multiply to those around you, to those that don't believe and to those that believe but are struggling. How many people are walking in your life right now that are walking along beside you, but they're struggling. And they're just looking for a reason to give God thanks and give God gracefulness and give God uh, gratitude. That they're, they're looking for a reason to continue on to do the things that God has asked them to do because they're struggling right now because everything is falling apart. And even those that are walking with them on the same path because they're evenly yoked and they're walking the same path, they do not hear the encouragement from this person to help them continue. How many times is that? Because see, sometimes our grateful response is not for us, but it's for those that are walking with us, but yet they're walking alone because nobody is reaching out to where they are. I like it when it's quiet. Because then I don't have to scream too loud and I have a voice later. You are their grateful response. You see, some of us are going to have to struggle with what it is to be a grateful response. A grateful responder. Maybe we'll do a discipleship class and we're going to have the team, the grateful responders, like the first responders. We're going to be the grateful responders. And that's where the grateful responders, your job is to go out and to be grateful in front of everybody else, not as a show, but because God's done so much in you to encourage them and to bring life back into them. You see, my brother-in-law was a fireman. And, and there was one time there was a, was a car fire on uh, um, Interstate 85 in Atlanta, and he made the newspaper. Oh, he made the news, and it was so cool. You could see him sitting there with the hose, putting the car out. and was hey, you're famous. We love it. He's a first responder. We need some grateful responders in the house. We need some people that's going to walk around with our coats and our hats and, 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 and our hoses of gratefulness and just spray it on people. Hey, I'm grateful. Are you grateful? I, you look a little bit down. Have a little gratefulness in your life. I, God's done so much in me. Let me just give you a little bit of what God's done in me. woo So many times we just, God's good. God's so great. 
I read seven chapters today. Oh, yeah. What did you read, Leviticus? I didn't understand it, but I just read it. I read, I read Ezekiel in the authorized King James. I don't have a clue where that's at. <laughs> God don't need those kind of Christians. We got enough of those. God's calling some grateful responders to step out when people are struggling, people can't do what they need to do. We find somebody or some, some ones, I wrote as to be a little comical, some ones, we find that in Acts chapter 4. People that are responding in a way that shakes up the norm of society. Acts chapter 4 tells us of people that have radically been changed and are radically grateful in the way of living for God that they've given up all their stuff to advance His stuff. Philippians 2 and 5, I said this last week, we're going to expound on it. Have this mind among yourselves, which is also, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who through... Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with him a thing to be grasped. Verse 7, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Last week we said, have this mind that was in you. This week we're saying that Jesus did more than just have a mind that was grateful, have a mind for his father. But he had some actions that came along with the mindset that he has. Because if all you have is a mindset for God, you're absolutely no good to him. There was a, an evangelist that I, I got saved under. I don't know if he, he came up with this quote, but, but he said it in one of the sermons. He said, so many people are so heavenly minded that no earthly good. Do you know anybody like that? They're so heavenly minded that they're absolutely no earthly good. They do absolutely nothing to advance the kingdom of God. But here we are, we find Jesus having the mindset after his father and having this and, and emptying himself, giving up all that he has, all the royalty and, and, and divinity that he has, he's giving it up. And he's taking on the, 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 the suit of a man and coming to earth to live as we had lived. Giving up everything. Does that sound like something that you heard? If not, it's in Acts chapter 4. They was doing the exact same thing. Oh yeah, they, they were mortal men. They were not giving up their divinity. But what they were giving up was their stuff. They emptied themselves of self or of self stuff and to help and to share what God had done to them to others. They was giving up everything that they had to, to advance the kingdom of God. They gave up everything. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 32 says, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that they... It does not say this man was part of the, the upper room experience. It does not say that, but it says that, that, that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. He believed so much in Jesus. He was going to empty everything that he had. He sold all that he had, and he gave it to the apostles for the advancement of the kingdom of God. His, he was grateful for what God had done in his life, that he was giving up everything so others could, could have the same gratitude that he had and get the same experience that he had. He emptied himself for God. Joseph was so grateful that he had given up everything to tell, that he could spread the message to touch many hearts. Joseph was not just another person or a disciple or apostle. His actions moved people. His gratefulness changed people's life. 
Do you understand that your gratitude towards God can save a person's soul from eternal damnation? Do you understand you being grateful in the presence of somebody else could bring them to the point of kneeling at the cross and accepting Jesus Christ all because you have a grateful response? Some people that are walking alone, even though they're in a crowd of people, need a grateful responder. And that's what we need to get into our minds today. His grateful response to Jesus garnered a nickname that was given to him by his peers. Do you have a nickname? I'm going to call somebody up here to give me a nickname. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? But we can go back to high school. I, you know, some of you got some silly nicknames because I say y'all start looking away. Oh, you better not say it. You better shut your mouth. All right? When I, when I, was, when I played football, they called me Jakob. I have no idea why. I had a friend that just made up names. Jakob might be a different way of saying Jacob. I don't know. It might have been his way of butchering my name in a different language. Now, he was American. Well, he was Southern, so, you know, we, we have our own. You know how it is. Y'all Cajun. Y'all got your own language. We got our own language. But somehow, we can all communicate, right? But I, my name was Jacob, and later on, I was known as Preacher. When I come play f- football, they hey, we got Preacher. Preacher's on our team. I was Preacher, and that's the nickname that I wanted to have. Because no matter what went on, no matter how bad we got our behinds book, no matter how great we did, no matter how many fights broke out, they knew Preacher was going to be Preacher. And the new preacher was going to do what preacher was supposed to do. He was not going to participate in that junk. He was not going to say words that were not supposed to be said. And he was going to have an attitude that was going to exemplify what God was all about. And so I was preacher. Everybody knows me as preacher. And I love the fact that I'm known as preacher. That was before anything. But, but, but I love the fact that I had a nickname that my peers gave me. It's something when your peers, it's different when you give yourself a nickname. Right, when we was at uh, 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 the minister's luncheon yesterday in, in Natchez, Natchez, whatever you want to say, in Mississippi, we was in Mississippi, we was in Mississippi, we was at the hotel in Mississippi, and we had our, our, our holiday thing, we, we had to use our initials to our name to come up with our Cajun name. Well, Gavin had the best name ever. His was Big T. And so I'm going to start calling him Big T. I didn't like my nickname because my nickname, my middle name was Gator, and I hate anything about Gator, you know, because it's all about Florida. So I hated that. So I was wanting to be something else. I, I, I was making fun of, of, I said, I was, I was, I don't know, Ugly Gator Richard. I said, I'm Richard. They said, that's Richard. I said, I'm from Georgia. It's Richard. Right? So I was just making fun. We were just having a good old time. But, but we got nicknames. Well, this same guy, this same Joseph, this same Levite had a nickname given to him by his peers. And it says, verse 36, for instance, there was Joseph, the same one that we just read, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas. Give you a name that exemplifies and it begins to, well, well, what's the easiest way to describe you? Encouragement. That's who you are. You're, in, you're the son of encouragement. How do you like that? I think Joseph looked at them and said, oh, thank you. I'll take that. I, I will take that. But see, but the thing about it, Joseph was, was grateful for what God had done in his life. He was grateful that he gave up everything, that, that he could touch people's lives. Joseph was known as, as Barnabas. His nickname was given to him by his peers, by those that witnessed his passion and gratefulness towards God that changed his life. If your Christian brothers and sisters right now can give you a nickname that, w- that would describe your Christian walk in your mind, what would that be? Now, if it's a bad word, you need to come. We'll have an we'll, we'll have a, a altar service in just a moment. If it's not a word that's going to give love to Jesus, come on down. We'll pray for you. I got a bunch of oil. If we can't find any, we'll get some Crisco over there, and we'll just make sure we'll, we'll get you all nice and covered. Well, Pastor, that don't make sense. If your actions among your Christian friends does not garner a name that's going to bring glory to God, what are you doing in their presence? Because if you're not living the life that God's wanting you to live in front of your Christian friends, baby, you ain't doing it in front of your sinful friends. I don't care how good you think you are. If you can't do it here, right, because we're all different in family, 
We let our hair down and within family. We, we, do, uh, we live a different life when it's family, but when the, the other people come in, you know, we're, we're prim and proper. We, we, we're mine and our, you know, we get those looks from mom and dad when they're cutting them eyes at you, you know. I wish you, you've probably seen them videos on YouTube where the guys can make their eyes bulge out of their socket. You ever seen those? Oh, man, it's, I'm like, dude, this thing ain't going to go back in your head, is it? But, but every now and then, I, I could remember when we get around stuff when I was a kid, my mom can't really do that. But that's what I saw when she gave me that look. You know, she, she shot her eyes at me, and then my eyes just got big coming out at me. If your brothers and sisters that are walking with you day in and day out does not have a nickname for you that's going to lift Christ up, that's not going to make people say, wow, I need to be around this person. What do the people that don't know who Jesus Christ is think about you? Well, it's not about thinking. No, it's not. But it's about your actions and your response to what Jesus has done in your life that's going to make people be gravitating towards you so you can pull them. If I am lifted up, I'm lifting Jesus up. And as they lift Jesus up, they're going to look and say, somebody's lifting Jesus up. And, and if, they're, if I'm holding Jesus up and they're being gravitated towards him, they're coming towards me because I'm holding him up. And if I'm holding him up, I'm having a nickname that people are going to begin to talk about. You see, I'm going to, I'm going to skip some stuff, but, but without Barnabas, we might not have a lot of our New Testament. Because without Barnabas, we would not have the Apostle Paul. Because after Paul had his Damascus Road experience, he went to go to the church, but nobody wanted to be around him because of the nickname that Paul had. Wait a second! This dude was just killing us. Don't let him in. He's a sheep. He, he's, a, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You need to keep him away from me. He's going to kill us. He's just trying to infiltrate the house. You like my southern accent? But what they did was then Barnabas spoke up for him. Wait a second. Guys, counsel, <laughs> sit down. Let me tell you something. This dude had an experience on the road. He found Jesus. I know he did. You see, I honestly believe that when you live a life of gratitude and you get closer to God and you begin to understand what God's doing in your life, God begins to drop some different gifts within your life. And I believe when we begin to live a life of gratitude, God begins to give us discernment well can can you correlate that with everything well i'm just telling you this when god gives you something your talents you begin to use those talents that he gives you what is he going to do he's going to give you more but when he gives you those talents you say well, how the scare you is going to beat me so i just hit it right here so i could give it to you when you came and what does he do he takes them and he gives them to the one that's used them and I believe as Barnabas began to live his life and began to live a life of encouragement and a life of gratitude towards God, God began to drop things in his spirit. And he began to hear God a lot more because he was so grateful for what God's done. There was a communication line that had been opened and he, he lived a life of discernment and he was able to go and to bring Paul to the council. And he said, they stayed there for a year. And because of that, Paul was able to go and Barnabas went with Paul on his first missionary journey. They had a little falling out when, when Barnabas' cousin and Paul didn't have a, you know, when John Mark and Paul said, hey, you know, let's fight. And, no, we ain't going to fight. And, and so Barnabas went with his cousin, which is the, the author of the book Mark. But there was something about Barnabas. You see, I bet you if I'd ask you who Joseph the Levite was in Acts, you wouldn't have a clue who I was talking about if you did not read that scripture. But I said, Barnabas, you said, oh, yeah, I heard that name before. You only know that name because people understood the gratitude that he had and they gave him that name. What name are people giving you? What name? I'm not talking about what name you're giving yourself. I'm talking about, let's be honest, what name are people giving you? A.W. Tolzer said this, Gratitude is an offering precious in the sight of God. And is it, and it, it is one that the poorest of us can make and not the poor but richer because we have made it. I'm going to close with this. In Psalms chapter 52, verse 9, it says this, I will praise you forever, O God, for what you have done. I will trust in your good name in the presence of your faithful people. 2 Corinthians 4 and 15, all this is for your benefit 
so that the grace that is reaching more and more. The last quote that I have is by K. Arthur. God is in control in everything, and therefore in everything I can give thanks, not because of the situation, but because of the one who directs and rules over it. That's powerful. God is in control, and therefore in everything I can give thanks.